unfair, based on improper considerations that have no basis in fact or law. Yes, of course. The verdict and the sentence. Well, what she took was the unanimous consensus of professionals who have studied this site as objective, independent, professional researchers and reduced it to a selection of a word here and a word there and twisted it on its head. The fantasy is that long sentences make any difference. The fantasy is that the Internet will not be a source for drugs or illegality because of this sentence. The fantasy is that this sentence is anything more than just purely punitive and completely beyond the range of what drug offenders get in this district, in this circuit, in this country. Every single drug case has the same elements here, yet Mr. Ulbricht was saddled with all of it. And that's unfair, unjust, and unreasonable. Appeal. We appeal to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. We appeal the verdict at trial, also some of the pretrial issues, and the sentencing itself as well. Uh, just generally, there's the pretrial motions on suppression. The verdict, uh, the, the, the trial issues are mostly about the, uh, the curtailment of the defense case not only with respect to experts, but also obviously you know what we, you now know what we were burdened by at trial, which was the fact that we knew that the case agent who made the first contact with Dread Pirate Roberts was in fact entirely corrupt, that he had a Confederate Secret Service agent who was entirely corrupt, and that we were not permitted to use that information in any respect, even though Agent Der Yegen, who was there today, at the, at the sentencing at the government table, Dr. Yegan from Chicago was in intimate and regular contact with them, and it was a major issue in the course of their investigation. But we were prevented from using any of that at trial. That is going to be an issue. We have issues with the experts. We have issues with the prejudice of uncharged, unproven conduct that drove this sentence dramatically. It was not about the crime that he was convicted of. This was about appeals to emotion. There are reasons why we've evolved for 2,000 years from a society, from a civilization that let the victim decide the punishment. And unfortunately, after 2,000 years of progress in that regard, we are moving back in the opposite direction. And that, that was a, there was a transparent appeal by the government to emotion beyond what the crime was. a hard question to answer because surprise I mean am I surprised I'm disappointed tremendously uh, but obviously this was a possibility so you prepare yourself for all of the possible ramifications of what's going to occur so disappointment uh, disappointment is probably the major emotion I feel sure if you have specific questions if, if they're willing to answer I'm okay yeah if I can talk very heartbreaking. I feel for anyone who's lost a loved one to drug abuse. It's a horrifying tragedy. It is. And it was terribly, terribly upsetting. Here. I think he showed that he does uh, feel remorse for anything that might have caused harm inadvertently through this. I'm, I know Ross. I know how compassionate he is. There's a hundred letters that have been submitted to the court saying how compassionate and empathetic he is. And of course he was moved by it. It was obvious. Can, can I answer the remorse question? Yeah. Can I answer the remorse question a little bit too? Because this is an interesting issue. You know, uh, Mr. Nash got 17 months, pleaded guilty to the entire indictment, took the entire weight of the drugs, got a minor role reduction as he deserved. And I wasn't suggesting that his sentence should be the same as Mr. Ulbricht's. But what you have here is 17 months versus life. The only difference between them is one person pleaded guilty and one person exercised their constitutional right to trial. This is what we call a trial tax. And here, it's beyond a tax. Well, can people do support the appeal? Where do they go to get money for the appeal? 
Yes, we really do need support to uh, appeal, and freeross.org is where you go. Thanks for the question. Appreciate it. No, I'm sorry. With Ross? None. No. No. Oh, well, Ross was crying <laughs> during his uh, statement. Um, you know, he's looking at his life being destroyed, and um, of course, but he's also was very moved by those stories, as we all were. But like uh, Mr. Draytel said, I feel like it's also somewhat exploitive and appealing to emotion. And I think personally somewhat of a distraction from the corruption allegations that were made and the revelations that were made. There's a lot of questions that have not been answered about that corruption. There's still sealed information about it. In my mind, there's still questions about um, the whole integrity of the evidence. And the other thing that's interesting is two of those overdose deaths happened while the government had the server. They owned it and controlled it, and they kept it open open for business, and those two deaths happen. And by their logic, are they liable as well? Right Haven't thought that far. <laughs> Not really, you know. We're take we've been taking this thing day by day. It's pretty overwhelming, just one day at a time, to be honest. We've been trying to determine. We're very concerned for safety. We've been told by people who've been in maximum security prisons that it's violent and very dangerous. Ross is not violent. He is not someone. That's been proven by the letters from the inmates and guards that he's been with in New York. He's nothing but a positive influence. He's totally nonviolent. And to put him in a maximum security penitentiary, I fear for his safety. I, I fear for his life. And um, I think it, a medium security place would be much safer. But with this sentence, I don't think that's, I don't know if that can be possible.